evening and welcome to the Poolsville Cluster Meeting. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Jane Learman, the Poolsville Cluster Coordinator. Good evening, members of the Board of Education, PTA leadership, MCPS staff, and of course, the most important guests are community members. My name is Jane Learman, and I'm, I am one of the Poolsville Cluster Coordinators. The cluster PTAs are hosting this meeting with the Board of Education so that we can let them know who we are and all the good things that we are, have going on in our cluster. Each PTA will introduce their school and highlight items from their own school. This is also a chance to let the Board of Education know some of our challenges that we face within our cluster. Each school has specific issues, but we're focusing on three main topics, which during the meetings method, which will be broken down. Our PTA leadership includes our, our other cluster coordinator, Hannah Donart, PTSA president of Poolsville High School, David Griffith, JPMS uh, PTSA president, Heather Witt, uh, PES, Poozla Elementary, uh, Maria Bardos McGuire, and the co presidents at Monocacy Elementary, um, Anne Marie Hickey, and oh, I'm sorry. Julie Brower. Julie, Julie Brower, thank you. And of course, I'm sorry, there are too many people on the screen. Um, and of course, our wonderful principals, uh, Mark. Carothers of uh, Poolsville High School, John Green of JPMS, Doug Robbins of Poolsville Elementary School, and Kristen Albin of Monocacy Elementary School. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn this over to the real leaders in this community, our PTA and PTSA leadership, who are going to give a, an overview of their schools. And I'd like to start with Anne Marie, and Julie from, from Monocacy Elementary School. Thank you. So I'm gonna try and share my screen because we have a little PowerPoint that we've put together. Uh, on, let me see if I can do it. This always makes me nervous. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Um, so first we wanna thank uh, um, members of the Board of Education and community members for being here today and to hear about the schools in the Poolsville cluster. Julie and I represent Monocacy Elementary School PTA, the smallest school in the county with 158 students in grades kindergarten through fifth. Being small allows Monocacy students to do many special things. We have all school field trips. All of our fifth graders have an opportunity to experience being members of the safety patrol and the leadership and confidence that instills and though we are small, we have an active drama club that puts on a production every spring. As a certified green school in the Ag Reserve, Monocacy has an active land club, recycling club, and engaged Earth Day activities. We have the best space, if I can make this screen move. Hold on. There we go. We have the best space. Oops, now it's moving too fast. Um, for, for our field day. Mm -hmm. um, our PTA has taken advantage of the green spaces around us with s'mores campfires and meetup hikes at the aqueduct. And we are doing outdoor lunch and uh, since last spring and have continued to expand outdoor lunch along with classrooms outside. While school was virtual, our students and families had amazing support from our teachers and staff. They spent countless hours helping families get resources from Chromebooks to how to get online, to how to get MIFIs and how to get food. Our resilience teachers handle large classes and have managed this situation with grace. Our school counselors set up Zoom meetings in the evenings to bake with our students and our PTA um, managed to have a virtual costume parade and delivered boo bags and Valentine treats and more. And the PTA organized lots and lots of Zoom town hall meetings with our principal who made herself available to answer all of our questions so many times. And now we are back and we have an active and engaged community. 
We had a back to school picnic with record attendance. We are gearing up for some of our traditional activities and introducing new ones like our upcoming walkathon. But we are the smallest school in the county and that also brings some challenges that we would like to share with you. We are by MCPS standards underutilized. In the upcoming boundary analysis, we would ask that you consider expanding the boundaries of Monocacy Elementary School to capture the students on Barnesville Road down to Little Seneca Lake at Black Hills Regional Park and on Comus Road up to Route 109, which would take some of the pressure off the Clarksburg schools and increase our student population. We think this would be a win-win. Currently, we have one class per grade, and when our classes grow, since there is only one, it is hard to address the large size. For example, our third grade class has 34 students. That is eight over the MCPS guidelines of 26 for a third grade class and should not be acceptable to any of us. Increasing our boundaries would support additional classes within the guideline sizes. And as a smaller school, we need some flexibility when asking for more teachers or staff. We are small, but we should also be afforded the same equities that other school, small schools are afforded. Our core team should be no different than the core teams of other small schools with at least two full-time and two part-time positions. Currently, we have only one full-time and three part-time positions in our core team, making staffing even more challenging. And like all the other schools countywide, capital projects at Monocacy were delayed due to COVID such as the HVAC replacement and the refrigeration, refrigerator replacement in our cafeteria. We ask that those, we appreciate that those are still in, in progress and we ask that those projects not be delayed further. We are a gem in the MCPS system and we appreciate you taking the time to hear about our wonderful little school and the challenges we face. And without question, we have the best view in the county and invite you to come out and visit us sometime soon. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good evening. Thank you to the Board of Education for meeting with our cluster PTAs. My name is Maria Bardos McGuire, and I currently serve as the president of Poolsville Elementary School Parent Teachers Association. Over the last five years, Poolsville Elementary School has evolved into a central gathering location for our growing community. The student population has increased by 27% since 2016 and exceeded projections by 6% which correlates to the increasing residential construction and resale of homes. The spotlight is on Poolsville as a result of our amazing cluster of award-winning schools. More young families are moving to our zip code to be part of a charming town within Montgomery County. As our community is growing, so is the diversity of our population. And over the last five years, our minority student count has doubled. Our African-American and Hispanic students now make up 22% of our total PES population. The increase in total elementary students will impact the middle school count as the classes transition as expected, and Heather with JPMS will address this later. In most recent years, our testing, our state testing scores have placed us in the top 15 to 20 ranking for elementary schools within the county. According to the last reported Maryland Department of Education scorecard, we are not only hitting our annual target, we improved and exceeded our year-over-year -year scores in academic achievement and academic progress. Our dedicated teachers and administration and support team at Poolsville Elementary have worked tirelessly to ensure that our students have the resources to learn and succeed. Fast forward to today's unique and new normal lifestyle due to the COVID pandemic, our educators have been spread thin, stressed, wearing multiple hats, and just riding this bull hanging on. At the same time, teaching our children and continuing to be positive role models during this mentally and psychologically challenging time for all. The experiences of young children can carry through adulthood. It is important that the county provides sufficient and accessible mental and physical health resources for smaller and up county communities such as ours. We thank the Board of Education for approving and providing Poolsville Elementary School with new student desks and chairs just this past year. This new equipment only enhances our children's learning experience. 
Our next improvement project request is the replacement of our intercom PA system in the restroom at the front of the school to ensure that all announcements can be heard clearly throughout the entire building. Currently, the system is older than our principal. I have to give a huge shout out to all of the wonderful parents who dedicate their time, energy, and resources to our cause. From planning movie nights for the kids to silent auction and dinners for the, to the, parent, for the parents, from book fairs to the National PTA Reflections Program, it's our community partners and parent volunteers that are the driving force of our PTA. A couple years ago, we kicked off a new program at the school, which is a modified version of the National Watchdogs Program. While keeping the main goal of encouraging more fathers and father figures to volunteer in the school, we customized it and opened it up for all parents to join in. We had an amazing response from our parents and the assistance provided to the school was above and beyond what we could have imagined. Witnessing these successful events year after year, partnering with the fabulous PES teachers and staff and collaborating with our local Poolsville businesses. These are all reminders that we are a strong and tight community that more people wanna be part of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. I think we're going to go back and um, I think we had a few opening remarks that, you know, we're on technology and we got a little bit ahead. So I'm going to ask <clears throat> Mr. David Griffith, if he would like to speak a minute. Um, I'm, <clears throat> Ms. Wolf, I'm, I'm happy to defer to the board if you want to start, uh, if you would like to do your opening remarks and introductions and I can go after that. All right, thank you very much. So good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Brenda Wolf, the president of the Montgomery County Board of Education. It's such an honor to be here tonight. And I would like to give my colleagues at this time a moment to say hello, starting with our vice president, Ms. Silvestri. Good evening, everyone. So great to see you turn out tonight. Dr. Daka. Good evening. Glad to be here and enjoyed the breakfast at Pool Day. <laughs> Ms. Silvestri, I mean, Ms. Vandrowski, I'm sorry. That's okay. Hi, good evening. Thanks for everyone for coming. Good to see you. Ms. Harris. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us. Ms. Evans. Always good to see everyone. Glad to be here. And Miss O'Looney. Good evening, everyone. I had the pleasure of visiting Poolsville High School and John Pill Middle School um, at the end of September. So it's nice to see some familiar faces. So I want to begin by thanking MCCPTA for organizing this meeting and providing us the opportunity to come together to, to discuss something that we all care deeply about, and that's the education of our children. We had hoped to have this meeting in person. As you know, that's why it was postponed until the fall. But of course, the Delta variant intervened and we have what we have. We won't let this prevent us from being in community with you tonight. Rather, we celebrate the fact that virtual meetings have increased our public participation. We might not all be in the same room, but we are all here. As you know, the impact of this worldwide pandemic has been felt by many professions and in many public services, including public education. And so we begin, I wanna take a moment of privilege and thank all of the teachers, staff, administrators, students that are here tonight. The last 18 months have been a challenge for all of us. I don't say this lightly, as you know, I. I'm the grandparent of a second grader, so I understand exactly what the parents have been going through. I also want to take um, a moment to, to, to say that, you know, like um, I think it was Dr. Daka said, I'm sorry that I missed the Poosville breakfast and parade this year, but as you know, we were away. Anyway, getting back to this, our educators have developed new ways to teach and engage our students. Our staff have worked tirelessly to prepare our buildings, 
our common areas, our buses, and to make them as safe as possible each day. I also want to recognize the heroic role that each of you has pay, played during this time. We look forward to listening and dialoguing respectfully and thoughtfully. We won't always agree on everything, but we do have a deep belief in our shared mission, and that is to prepare our students to thrive in the careers and community. Thank you again for being here tonight and for listening to one another and for sharing. We appreciate you spending the evening with us. So should I turn this back over to you, David? I don't see you. No, where'd I go? Um, actually, I, I, I think we're gonna turn it over to um, Heather Witt of uh, John Poole Middle School first. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Heather Witt and I am president of the John Poole Middle School PTSA. I want to express my gratitude to the members of the Board of Education. We truly appreciate all you do for the public schools in our, in our county and devoting your time to learning more about the schools in the Poolsville cluster specifically. I am very excited to speak with you tonight on behalf of the John Poole Middle School community. We may be the smallest middle school in Montgomery County but what we lack in enrollment numbers, we make up for in passion and engagement from our administration, teachers, staff, students, parents, and community. I was honored to serve as the parent representative on the JPMS instructional leadership team for two years and was extremely impressed with the team's positivity dedication, and creative problem-solving skills. Their ability to adapt and address issues rapidly is a constant reminder of the amazing work you can achieve when trust, respect, appreciation, and care for all stakeholders are at the forefront of your decision-making process. Our most recent school highlights include the addition of a middle school level autism program, the first in our area. Announcement of the MCPS Middle School Counselor of the Year Award for our school counselor, Mr. Kevin Moruskin, and new tennis courts installed last summer. We are also currently slated to receive a new roof in August, 2022. Thank you, Board of Education, for answering this ongoing capital improvement plea and replacing our 25-year-old roof. We are going through an unprecedented time and our challenges can seem never ending. I feel very fortunate that my children had and continue to have the most caring environment for their middle school experience. In return, I would like to advocate for two issues today. The first one I hope you will keep in mind during capital improvement evaluations in November, and the second when the operational budget is developed in January. Our school is in desperate need of a new HVAC system in the main office. Our school professionals deserve to work in an environment that is at an acceptable temperature. The temporary fix provided by MCPS only addresses the hallway and common areas and not the individual offices. Let's show our school professionals the same appreciation, care, and respect that they provide to our students every day. I would also like to advocate for our students. Being a smaller school, our students have less options to choose from when registering for electives. Our students are only able to access one third of the current MCPS middle school electives course catalog. I would like to see the day when all MCPS middle school students have access to the same electives at their home school. I hope that the experience we have gained regarding instructional options over the last couple of years 
will allow for creative problem solving for those living in a rural community. Our students should have access to the same world languages, STEM, consumer science, multimedia literacy, art, music, theater, and dance classes as those in the rest of the county. Our students have stepped up to unforeseen challenges recently. Let's step up for equity issues that are right in front of our eyes. Challenges can bring forth opportunity. You, the Board of Education, have the opportunity now to build on the lessons we have learned to create equal educational opportunity for all students under your care. I and others in the John Poole community encourage you to envision additional instructional options and methods in order to offer the full range of courses to all students, including those in smaller schools with fewer staffing resources. Thank you for your time today. And I invite you to come out to the Poolsville area someday in the future to experience for yourself our small town charm and passionate, engaged community. Thank you. Thank you. I'm kind of out of order now, so I think we'll hear from Mr. Carruthers. No, we'll be hearing from David now. All right, that works. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, Chairwoman, um, and uh, thank you, Board, and all of the MCPS staff here. Uh, you might as well be hearing from Mr. Carruthers. It's uh, uh, talking about Poolsville High School. He's certainly more in the know about everything that's going on. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of the parents' perspective um, uh, about the school, and I, I, I try to be um, brief about this. Um, so, you know, as you know, um, Poolsville is the oldest high school in the county, uh, built in 1953, and uh, with the uh, current plans for the modernization, we've been talking to the architects, and they've shared with us that there is actually a core part of the building that dates back all the way to 1911. So more than 100 years old. Um, and actually, that reminds me, one of the things, uh, our, our cluster meeting actually was one of the last uh, events of the 2019-2020 school year that was uh, fell victim to the sudden shutdown in March of 2020. So actually, this, this cluster meeting is actually you know, two or three years delayed. Um, and I understand we're blazing a new trail here by doing it uh, virtually. I know you've been doing everything virtually, but uh, a cluster meeting virtually, I, I think, is a is a new development. Um, and, you know, I think like, like Poolsville High School and like the cluster itself, we're, we're just making do with what we've got. So the, um, let's see here, the, let me switch here. There. So uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, Mark Carruthers, our, our fearless leader, um, not only are we the smallest uh, or the oldest high school in the county, we're also the smallest with, with 1,200 students. But, you know, actually out here in the agricultural reserve, we are actually very diverse, as you can see by the student population with more than uh, half of our student body of um, uh, minority or racial and ethnic minority. Um, and then we're uh, very proud of our staff and our students. 68% uh, of our staff have been uh, in the profession more than 15 years. So we have a very, um, veteran personnel and uh, very proud of our, our, our graduates. As you can see there, almost 80% of them have gotten a three or higher on an AP test or a four on the IB. Now, I want to, a couple of things about the, the Poolsville cluster. We're small, but we're mighty. Um, one of the things that makes us a unique is that about two thirds of the students uh, at Poolsville High School uh, come from outside the cluster. And they come from actually all over the county. So. Uh, you know, in some ways we are very locally focused and in yet in other ways we are, have a countywide perspective uh, on, on um, education and MCPS. And uh, Poolsville, I just mentioned the diversity, I wanted to highlight too that uh, Poolsville has the second highest concentration of Asian American students in all MCPS high schools. 
Obviously, I wouldn't be remiss about talking about the rankings. Uh, had this been uh, a couple months ago, we could have been talking about our number one ranking, but Whitman, um, we are now number two in the 2021 U.S. News and World Report rankings, the number two ranked high school in the state, the number two ranked high school in the county, and the number uh, 119th ranked high school um, nationally. Now, that... Uh, that uh, success doesn't uh, come uh, by accident. It's a, a credit, obviously, to our students uh, who are hardworking, and it's a credit to uh, our, our teachers and uh, school administrators and support staff. I know MCPS has uh, seen over the years of my kids going through the K-12 system, an outstanding, I think, set of personnel. And I would say that at Poolsville, they are even more exceptional, um, and we're so proud of that. And also uh, appreciate their engagement with parents and families that has helped uh, drive our, our achievement. Um, now we are a whole school magnet program and we have four houses and those houses are Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, I'm, so I'm sorry, no, nope, um, they are actually wrong, sorry, wrong house. Uh, our students are wizards though in the classroom, uh, but our, our magnet programs, four houses are global ecology, uh, that is an inter interdisciplinary program through an environmental focus, uh, the humanities, which is a really neat program about the human experience through storytelling and critical thinking and analysis. Our ISP program, independent study program, uh, which is a self-directed uh, program for students, gives them a lot of flexibility, but also gives them some direction if they're interested in that with uh, some engineering and community service paths. And then we've got what's called our SMACS program, which is a, a highly rigorous, essentially STEM program. Um, and one of the interesting things about that is the SMACS program, actually, uh, um, they're so smart that they are able to bend the time-space continuum. They actually have an additional eighth period to the, to the um, above and beyond the typical MCPS high school uh, schedule. So they, they get a little, a little bit. Uh, extra there. Um, I, if I had been technically savvy, I would have been able to play the videos that uh, uh, Ms. Bins, Ms. Marks, Mr. Young, and Mr. Lee had, had uh, prepared a very short vignettes. I've included links there. I don't know if they're going to be accessible to people watching this, but I will, uh, after I stop speaking, we'll put those uh, links in the chat for people to be able to access. Now, I told you about the good, and there's no good without bad, uh, or without challenges, I should say. And like, I think all um, students, in, in, and particularly high school students and adolescents, um, they have been um, struggling uh, with uh, a, a, almost a year of uh, 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 virtual learning and uh, social distancing and isolation. Um, but uh, that's sort of the acute crisis, the longer term, issue is about student self-care and the need for social emotional learning, which I think the, the, the pandemic has obviously brought to the fore. Um, we have uh, students that are, uh, I'd say, study hard, play hard, uh, but they also have, um, uh, you know, needs as well. They're highly competitive. They suffer from anxiety. They have to suffer from, uh, again, these uh, COVID maladies. And so I would put out a plea, uh, not just for Poolsville, but for really all the high schools and really all the schools in the county for additional school counseling. Uh, to help support our students during this time, but also as, after this crisis pass, passes, uh, that we uh, have this available to students to support them um, in whatever, you know, however they um, uh, are, are struggling, uh, whether it's uh, mental or physical health. Um, and also think about uh, Poolsville High School um, as, 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 you know, I, again, on the surface, it seems everything's going well like a duck. But it, uh, underneath, if you think about it, the students that come to Poolsville High School are in some ways special needs students because they are coming to our school because their uh, home school is not, is not uh, able to provide them with the uh, academic or social emotional learning or, or um, uh, supports that they have. And so, you know, they come from all over the county in some ways, maybe slightly dispossessed. And so, you know, again, that's something to think about that, uh, you know, we have, um, we are doing great work, but we also uh, have great support needs for our students. And then lastly, I, I would have to put out a plug. I know we're going to talk about the school construction later, but that doesn't mean 
in the interim while the construction is happening that uh, uh, we don't need a fully staffed building services team, which we currently don't have. And in fact, I think, you know, with the dust of construction, I think that might be uh, needed even more. So uh, I am contractually obligated to talk about the new school and the need for a bigger gym and an updated athletic fields, but we will talk about that during, I think, the uh, general community conversation. So again, uh, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Carruthers, our wonderful staff, uh, the families uh, of Poolsville High School, the Poolsville community, and uh, our learning community at large. Thank you. Jane? I'd like to introduce um, Mark Carruthers. Um, he's very unique um, as a high school principal because he was hired in 2019. And then in March of 2020, the school shut down. And he was our virtual principal until April of last year, until students came back. So this is his first full year as an in-person principal at Poolsville High School. Uh, he literally was just kind of thrown into the fiery pit and he arose as a phoenix. Um, I'm honored to introduce him and um, would love to, um, to hear a few comments from you. You're muted, Mark, can't hear. Thank you. Um, going through my phone, so I appreciate that. Apparently, I had to unmute in two different places. But thank you for the uh, the, the very passionate introduction. Uh, made it seems like a, it's, it's a very treacherous job that I have here, but it's, it's I truly believe it's the, the best job in the world. Uh, fiery pit or not, um, you know, I, I did. Uh, this is my third year as principal of Poolsville High School, and every year has definitely been a learning experience uh, from the 2020 shutdown to last year's virtual learning and the, the return to physical learning here this year. But um, I'm privileged to be in such a supportive and passionate community and surrounded by a fantastic staff and, and wonderful educational leaders, both within my building, but also within the cluster. And I'm very fortunate uh, to have the cluster of colleagues that I have and the, uh, the, the community that I have that support our students. I really like, uh, I think um, Dave's comment really resonated with me that, you know, although two thirds of our population come from out of our immediate area, they are quickly welcomed and, and you know, um, welcome into the Poolsville, the, the, the community that is in the immediate area uh, to, to give that small town uh, community support uh, with uh, the overall uh, MCPS mission. So I appreciate the introduction and, and, I, and I appreciate uh, President Wolf and the distinguished members of the board and, 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 and everybody's time this evening to hear about our fantastic cluster and, and some of our uh, advocacy and needs. So thank you everybody. So there are other members of MCPS staff that I'd like to introduce, uh, the, the members of the Board of Education. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Mary Jane Ennis, who's the Chief of Learning Achievement and Administration. Uh, we have um, Lori Christina Webb, who's the Chief of Staff of the Board of Education. Darlene Harris, who's Executive Director. Um, we have Michelle Palmer, who's the, who's the Psychological Service Coordinator of, of Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, we have Seth Adams and um, Adrian Karameas, who are in, involved in the building and construction side of the house. And, um, I, and Diane Morris, who is, um, I don't remember your title, but I know you're with OSSI, right? <laughs> Hi there. I tried to write the titles down very quickly. Um, so we thank everybody who is here. Um, we had we were asked to uh, submit our agenda so that we could have the right um, staff members here to answer our questions. And I think that maybe this is the time to just launch into the agenda. Uh, we, uh, on the advice of the Board of Education and MCPS, we narrowed it down to three topics. Uh, construction of the high school, uh, health and safety issues, and equity issues. Um, and we're going to take, uh, we're going to divide the agenda up approximately into thirds. 
David is going to start talking about the uh, construction issues at uh, Poolsville High School, specifically issues. Um, we, we, as you know, we are reconstructing the high school. We're very excited about that. Uh, but there are some concerns we have about the size of the gym and our athletic facilities. So, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Jane. Um, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we've uh, we've been hoping to uh, host the Board of Education at our high school um, since March 2020, um, and uh, we had hope had hope that we might be able to do it this year, but you know, COVID would not allow that, which we sort of all understand. But in, in talking um, uh, and planning for this meeting, what we really wanted to do to, to because we talk about uh, some of these things about the school and the construction, but uh, it really wanted you to be on site to be able to visually see it. So what we had talked with the board staff about is perhaps a, a, a brief uh, uh, quote unquote video. Uh, again, I'm not that tech savvy, so it's a little bit more of an animated um, PowerPoint that I think would be great to set the context, not not so much maybe for the board, it's very well aware of this, certainly for the staff, but I think for our, our community at large, and particularly our younger families who may not be aware of the history and what's been going on with the high school construction is going to play such an outsized important role for them moving forward and their younger students. So if it's all right, I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully share my screen again and uh, start this animated uh, PowerPoint. I think it runs about three, three and a half minutes. Um, and then we can, we can start the conversation. Okay, whoops, let me do this. Okay.
All right. David, I would just like to add something. Um, I wanted to thank you for the presentation comparing the different schools. I want to turn people's attention to Damascus High School, which was not included in your presentation. Their enrollment is about 150 students more than Poolsville High Schools. And yet their gym, their indoor and outdoor facilities are far more robust than Poolsville High School. And they probably have about the same percentage of students participating in athletics. Our Lady of Good Council, which I totally get it, totally different funding. Uh, they also have extremely robust athletic facilities and their enrollment is 1200. David, did you want to um, put, um, did you want to add anything or just have the community um, gather questions from the community? How do you want to do this? Yeah, I think we can just open it up for, for questions. Um uh about uh about the construction the construction project um you know there's i know there's a lot of questions and concerns about the increased co construction co uh, in increased cost of construction materials um and the impact on the schedule um and also you know again i think top of mind for a lot of people is the <clears throat> the uh, amenities that uh, you know were highlighted in that presentation so Oh, okay, so I, I, I'm sort of I'm moderating here. I, I guess there's a Q and A uh, feature. There's also a chat feature. I don't know where that came. I think that came through the chat. So um, the question did come in about the the, um, the budget costs, and I know the the, the uh, board did approve uh, some shifting of funds. I think it was last month to um, from the Dufife Dufif project um, to account for those increased instru construction costs. Um, but I guess the question is if supply chains start to become efficient again and uh, and inflation comes down and construction costs return to their normal levels, will um, will our construction project be able to retain, I suppose, those, ad those additional funds that have been earmarked for the added construction costs and could they be put to use for, um, again, the purposes of uh, like improving the, um, uh, athletic fields and uh, you know sort of other other um, parts of the building of physical plant or uh, property. Hey, hey, David, this is Seth Adams. I, maybe it would be a good a uh, good time for me just to provide a, a little update in terms of of where we are in the project. Um, obviously, where where we've been in in terms of design and and some of the bid opportunities that uh, you know we'll, we will be exploring in the future. Um, you know, but one thing I would say is is start out by saying um, absolutely we we acknowledge the the concerns. Um, you know, one thing I would point out is is our our board of education is, is not a funding body, so all funding, additional funds, certainly has to to go through the county council, which I know is certainly engaged in this. So, you know, as we as we work through our CIP, um, as we work through some of the the cost challenges, you know, we we will certainly. Uh, keep uh, Mr. Crothers as well as all in, involved, all stakeholders involved, and in, in apprised of what the next steps are. You know, you you are correct. One of the uh, one of the actions the Board of Ed just recently took um, was to remove funds from one project in order to uh, transfer them into uh, our major capital projects, which include Poolsville High School. Um, certainly, this is. Uh, again, not being a funding body, that request is going to the county council, and I believe will be introduced uh, next week uh, to start, you know, those those conversations. But that is an additional uh, twelve point eight million dollars that the board of education um, is is asking to transfer into this particular project. Um, you know, it is also important to acknowledge the fact that that sort of post COVID, we are experiencing. Um, not just we, but you know, industry as a whole are experiencing quite a few uh, supply chain delays, cost increases, labor shortages. Um, some recent bid experiences that we've just had have, have uh, been extremely high. Um, so one of the strategies we've also looked at with Poolsville High School, because again, we know the, the critical um, timeline of this is to, is to start looking at you know, obviously bidding the project as a whole, but also breaking it into two pieces. 
so that if for some reason costs are higher than expected, we can still begin and we can still continue to, to construct um, while we work with the county council to, to uh, achieve more funds. Um, that first phase, which you know we will be bidding in the next couple weeks, uh, I think it's, it's actually November first of November when when bids start to come in. Um, you know the the goal is to start that classroom addition, which is going to add that capacity. Of, you know the increase the capacity by four hundred up to fifteen hundred students. Uh, and really, and for those that have not seen it, I, I would encourage you to go to our website and take a look at the renderings and, and the concepts. But it's uh, uh, obviously focused around academics, it's broken up into the houses, you know, so, so really understanding the existing program and trying to um, provide those facilities that, that meet those demands. Um, you know, also wrapping um, the arts around, you know, some, some of the existing auditorium, refacing the entire front space um, is all part of that phase one. Uh, should, for some reason, the entire project not be able to be funded due to the high construction costs. So, so I would say we've, we've been very, um, we've been trying to be very flexible with this project, again, because we know how critical the timeline is. Um, and, you know, I feel very optimistic that in the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have our bid results and we'll be able to take um, the bid information to the board for, uh, for approval and, and groundbreaking in January of 2022. In terms of the gym, again, I would I would say one of the things that we are looking at the gym, and I would also say the gym, if again for some reason um, we we face some funding challenges, the gym is the the sort of the tail end of the project, so it is one of the last things we will do um, as we're going through this build. So um, we are going to go through some pricing exercises for the expanded gym that would that would obviously increase the the seating capacity and, and the size of the space. Um, you know, but the good thing is we'll actually have a number. So versus having uh, working in the abstract and just assuming and, and estimating costs, we'll have real costs that we obviously will share with the community. Um, and if those costs are greater than our budgets, certainly start to work with, um, you know, our county council uh, partners to see if there are funds that we can apply and, and obviously uh, try to create that space that, that everyone um, in the Poolsville community is, is seeking. So uh, I do think, you know, again, we, we are in very troubling times in terms of the, just the overall construction industry, but I think we've, uh, we've definitely positioned this project well so that we can keep it on track and to keep uh, keep momentum moving forward. Uh, so hopefully that's a good snapshot, but um, for those that have not seen the project, certainly uh, our website has plans and, and we'd be happy to, uh, uh, to speak more to any of the details that, that, that folks may have, questions they may have. We have a couple construction specific questions. Uh, one is a really good one about when the HVAC is replaced at the high school, will it be a, shall we say, pandemic proof HVAC? And how are you approaching HVAC, HVAC systems writ large? Oh, that's, that's a great question. So, um, you know, HVAC systems certainly have, have, have seen a little bit of a transition in, in post pandemic use, obviously. Uh, there was always a heightened uh, focus on indoor air quality in schools, uh, but certainly making sure we were balancing energy along the way. Uh, Post-pandemic, obviously, the focus is hands down indoor air quality. Um, you know, we're, we're not abandoning our, our sustainability efforts, but, you know, IAQ is the number one approach. Uh, so all new HVAC systems, including what you'll see at Poolsville, will we'll have um, you know, dedicated ventilation systems and, you know, we'll... we'll you'll start to see air exchange rates, which are greater than what you have seen in the past school. So, so again, you know, a lot has changed post pandemic, but, um, you know, we, we are obviously at the final stages of, of those design uh, uh, details, but we're, we're, we're definitely well positioned to handle, um, you know, those post pandemic demands uh, that, that, that schools are, are currently facing. There was a funding question regarding the increased funds that are being diverted to Poolsville High School. Is that to pay for the new gym or is that to cover increased construction costs? So that's really intended to, to pay for the increased construction costs. And you know, our, our, again, the, there's been such volatility in this market that, um, you know, just for example, uh, you know, projects that we were tracking at, um, you know, $400 a square foot you know, a month ago, jumped to 400 plus 50, $450 a square foot within uh, the span of three weeks. 
Um, so that that cost is really to to account for um, you know that volatility uh, again to make sure that we can continue with the project. But but we're also working with the construction manager to, to look for efficiencies. So if if we are able to obviously bring this in under under some of these inflated costs, absolutely. Um, if the funds are there to pay for the gym, we're going to proceed with that. Um, but I, I would say we we are looking at this as as obviously managing and mitigating these increases and, and just being able to continue forward with uh, the project as is. Um, but the good news, again, as I mentioned, is that we'll have the cost information here shortly. So if it is above the numbers that we have, we can we can go back with a very specific ask of our, our county, county, part, county council partners. Um, there was a question about uh, splitting the project into, into two different parts. There was we needed some clarification about that. Sure. So, so the project is, as a whole is is designed, but um, you know one of the the concerns again with seeing this volatility and, and cost was um, if we needed to go back and ask for more money, um, that has significant delays in it. So, if if you think about, um, we already are appropriated over you know seventy million dollars for this project. So, if you're able to do a large portion of the project with the money you have, you don't have to wait. Um, you don't have to delay the start of the project to go back and ask for money if, if again, for some reason it's it's over budget. Uh, so that's a strategy in order so that we can keep this project on track. Um, and if that does uh, ultimately um, you know, end up being the case, first phase is going to take two years to complete. Um, so we're, we're essentially sequencing it. So um, you know, within that first two years, we could build the first phase, ask for the additional funds, rebid it, and then just seamlessly go into phase two. So that's the that's the thought process so that we can start the project on time should, um, you know, the, the bid experience be above what we are anticipating. Where will the students be when construction is going on? Will they be in the building or will they be in portables outside the building? Uh, it's going to be a combin. It's going to be a combination of portables and in the building. Um, I know we've been working very closely with with Mr. Brothers on, on you know, the, sort of the the different stages of the project. So uh, again, that's one of the things that um, you know, as the project progresses, students will be moving throughout the building. But one of the goals is to focus on that academic space, so that when students are able to then move out of the the existing building, they can move into brand new space. And then we can fall back into the existing building and, and take offline the, the old classrooms. But there will be portables involved. Um, but you know, approaching it in this manner really reduces the number of relocatables that are needed. Will the arts uh, part of the building be barred on par? Will it be on par with the, with other schools? Yes. Yes. So so obviously there is a, a an arts component that you're you're missing from. Uh, you know, from our educational specifications, so that will be part of the, the project. And, and the arts piece is in the first phase. So that is not, uh, that's not the second phase work. That is the first phase work when we're thinking about just from a cost standpoint. Jane, you're on mute. Uh, there's a question, uh, another financing question. Um, and this is also a question that I've had for the past few years. Why was the initial budget request so much lower than other high school construction renovation projects in the county? And why is it still and why is this still in the bidding process? So so the first question in terms of of the the dollar value. I, I would say we have to have a very clear distinction between the revitalization expansion uh, program versus the major capital project program. Um, one of the, the goals of the major capital project program is to uh, try to, to really focus on spaces that we can reuse um, so that we can spread the, the dollar much further. Um, one, one benefit to transitioning to this is that the Poolsville High School project leapfrogged other schools that were ahead of Poolsville High School in the, in the RevEx program. Um, so so I, I, when, and this is one of the things that we've, we've talked about at the board table many times. Unfortunately, there is a, always a first when it comes to a new program and Poolsville High School is the first high school in this program. 
Um, but if you look at the budgets that we have set for uh, the other schools, um, you know, Damascus, uh, Wooten, and Magruder. Uh, Wooten and, and Magruder are, are much lower than Poolsville. Um, Damascus is, is slightly higher only from the fact that we are looking to increase capacity to handle uh, the Clarksburg uh, cluster as well. So, so when, you, when you start to look at the budgets set for major capital projects in the high school level, Poolsville actually is one of the highest budgets um, that we have set within that, that particular program. In terms of, of, of the bidding date, um, you know, the, the bidding date is, is, a, is a function of, of obviously working from our, our completion date backwards. We, we did have some work that we were planning to do this summer, uh, but again, that, some of that work really came in at four times the cost. Uh, and you know, that's when we took a step back and started to resequence the project just to make sure that uh, we didn't make any missteps along the way. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, we didn't want to move students out into portables. We didn't want to move the office out into a portable and then not ultimately be able to, to do the work in those spaces. So we took that step back, that brief step back, re, re, uh, re analyzed the project and came up with this approach that uh, will ensure the completion date. Is the completion date still 2026? And I want to confirm that you said the construction would start in 2022. Correct. That's the intent is is to start obviously pending the the, the bid information and and board approval, but it would start uh, this January of 2022. Um, the bulk of the work will be completed by January. Actually, I think we're trending for yeah January 2024. Uh, so that is the goal is to have the academic space and phase sort of when you think about it that first phase phase one work completed. Um, and then the second phase, we're obviously still looking at that, but that may be, um, you know, anywhere from a year to 18 months to complete, depending on, you know, how far we go. So uh, we, we are trending for the bulk of the project to be completed by 2024 at this moment. We understand that the gym will be at the tail end of the project. When will the final bidding be done regarding financing the reconstruction of the gym? Well, so, so again, we're, we're going to bid the project as a whole, but also have it broken into two pieces uh, beginning in November. Um, so if the project as a whole is affordable um, within our budget at that November date, then we move forward with it as a whole. Um, if for some reason the, you know, the, the entire project is beyond our budget, we will pursue phase one. Um, and then obviously, you know, work with the county council and and others i i would say that one of the the things that we would most likely do is to is to quickly let the market calm down a bit rebid in six months to a year uh we don't lose time at that point it's just a, sort of a re looking at a reset of the market and and going back to bid with phase two uh if that ultimately ends up being the case um so so i Again, it's 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 tough to answer because we don't know what the bid results will be um, in the next couple of weeks. I'm I'm assuming based on our experiences that they're going to be high, um, but if they are, you know, we we have obviously a plan to uh, to revisit with the county council and and ask for those additional funds, which obviously can include at that time the expanded gym, and we'll have the 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 actual numbers that we can talk with the county council members about and and. I think uh, we'll be well positioned at that point to advocate for that space. This should be the last question in this block. Um, what's the lead rating of the building? L E E D rating? Oh, oh, oh yeah. So, um, so, so lead is is a, a measure of sustainability for for a building. Um, ultimately, you don't achieve your your lead certification to the end of the project. So. Um, we go into all our projects pursuing lead gold. Um, you know, we, we also beyond uh, you know the lead ratings, we're going to be exploring other sustainable opportunities here. Everything from 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 solar to um, you know other uh, you know sustainable type of program implementation measures. So so unfortunately, lead is lead certification doesn't happen until the end of the project. But you know, we we are pursuing a very sustainable building at the moment. Um, which, you know, there's there's no reason to believe that we will not achieve those goals as we work through the construction process. 
we're going to end this block and we're going to move on to, to uh, health and well being. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce um, Hannah uh, Donard, who is our new cluster coordinator. And um, she will be fielding questions about uh, people that have questions about health and well being in the cluster. Great. I just wanted to say a quick hello um, and also introduce myself. Um, I know Seth well. Um, he and I meet on a monthly, almost monthly basis now um, to discuss all, everything from indoor air quality, water quality, um, and safer cleaning and disinfecting. Um, I'm the chair of the Health and Wellness Committee for MCCPTA, as well as the um, chair of the Subcommittee for Environmental Health. Um, and uh, so I think this is a good segue in um, to these questions with the high school um, talking about the physical health of of our students while they're co-located on active demolition and construction site. Um, what kind of precautions, um, I just wanna start off the questions with um, you, Seth, what kind of precautions are you taking to make sure that those students are safe um, and that um, the air quality, <laughs> um, water quality, and um, their environment, physical environment is going to be ensured, it's gonna be safe for them while they're in school? Uh, great question. I, you know, obviously when you think about the building itself, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be, you know, putting up protective measures between obviously construction spaces and, and, uh, you know, occupied school spaces. The one, the one actually really good benefit of, of taking a step back and pivoting here is that, uh, essentially the, the, all this first phase new construction work will be completely isolated, um, from existing building systems. So, so we'll have to pay close attention to, you know, rooftop units and filters. And, you know, we, we do, Look to our budgets to increase filter changes through that because we know there's there's dust that's associated with construction and those sorts of things. But um, you know certainly we uh, we have great experience with with keeping the construction area very separated from from the academic area, and in, and obviously you know post COVID it's it's heightened. Um, so uh, you know really it's it's keeping our 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 track record of where we're going, but. Uh, uh, increasing the, the level of attention to, to maintenance and um, uh, some of our building service work. Great. Um, I guess one of the other questions with that, are you going to be monitoring air indoor and out um, during the construction phases? I know that OSHA has requirements for workers, but there's not really much for students. Um, so just wanting to know what kind of um, monitoring you're going to be doing in terms of air quality. That's a great, great question too, and and we have routinely worked with our contractors to to monitor um, existing spaces. It's actually we monitor both indoor, you know, from an indoor air quality perspective. Um, uh, we've we've actually done quite a bit of monitoring from from a noise and a vibration perspective. I mean, so we we really do take this seriously and and uh, you know spend a quite a bit of effort to make sure the contracting teams um, are held accountable and that we're we're measuring um, actual. Uh, you know, impacts along the way so that we can pivot if, if for some reason things, um, you know, are uh, trending outside of, of our acceptable standards. Great. Um, there's a question here. Um, I think this kind of leads into the indoor air quality stuff that we've been working on too, but um, what are some of the opportunities for people inside the global ecology program, students, um, teachers, um, to help out if possible in the process and help make it more sustainable? Um, I know we have a greenhouse um, there, and um, I know that um, there's also, you know, just environmental quality controls um, students could learn from. That's a great question, and, and actually the the uh, timing of it is perfect. You know, we, you know, as we cr created our new division of sustainability, um, we're also we've been working obviously with the, with the board um, on, uh, you know, developing a sustainability policy, and, and we're looking for student advocates to to get involved. Um, and, and I think this is a great opportunity with a project with, with a, a new initiative um, from, from, the, from the board perspective uh, uh, to bring in more student engagement and involvement. I think this is a great opportunity to get students involved in, in the project, but during the project, post and, and even after the project from, from a sustainability and a, um, an involvement perspective. So I, I think it's perfect timing. and. Uh, I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I would say, you know, let's leave students look out for invitations here soon to, to be a part of, of some, some future discussions, um, future meaning in the next couple of weeks, discussions on, on this topic. Great. We have some in an environmental health subcommittee. We have some um, students that have been participating that we'd love to get involved too. Um, and then I could, we have another question here about um, 
can you can you speak to the asbestos asbestos abatement and um, how that's going to be done? I guess off off school grounds, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, and, and asbestos, I know, um, you know, it is an extremely high regulated process. So, you know, we, we uh, you know, obviously we do have asbestos in our schools, um, but when there is remediation, it is, it is, again, it's, it's, it's a highly regulated, it's, it's extremely isolated from, um, from anyone outside of that um, remediation zone. Um, you will see signs on doors that remediation is happening, but but I would say it is one of the most the safest things that we do, um, and we are held accountable, obviously from uh, from the state, but also the federal federal um, uh, standards that are associated with this. So so again, that's one of those those items we'll work with Mr. Carruthers on when it's happening, um, because again, I, I know seeing signs on your door that it, asbestos, you know, something happening with asbestos going on is scary, but we'll. We'll definitely work to make sure that messaging is very clear. Great. Um, and then there's um, some other questions that I had too with um, water quality, um, so and air quality too. Um, but three of our four schools in our cluster have two diamond ratings, um, and I know that the high school you're working on um, and that Monocacy is slated for a new HVAC. Um, can you tell us more about the timeline for Monocacy and then also John Poole's got a two diamond, and I know they've had some problems with their HVAC in the office. Um, so what plans you have in place, to, especially with COVID? Um, in line with helping getting your at the park. No, and, and unfortunately, Monocacy was sidetracked because of, of um, you know, the pandemic. But uh, you know, that project certainly is is getting back on track. And 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 our goal with all replacements is is obviously to bring them up to um, you know the highest level of indoor air quality standards. So so certainly we can uh, we can reach out. Not many not many folks I can honestly say get get too involved in wanting to know the the equipment replacements that happen at their schools, but we can definitely reach out um, uh, to the principals and talk through those and, and share information uh, about what that entails and, and just just sort of make sure everybody under you know is very clear about the work that's happening and when it's happening. So we, I will certainly reach out to uh, both principals to provide some updates on on the HVAC work. Great, um, and in line with that too, I know Seth, we've been talking a little bit, a lot about um, CO2 monitoring um, in the interim, because I know these projects take time um, and development and then funding and everything, um, but just kind of figuring out if there's some things that we can do to verify and just also to problem shoot if we need to and make sure the buildings are really, um, especially with COVID, um, removing the aeros aerosols in those rooms and protecting our students and staff. Great question and, and, and certainly, uh... You know, we, we have been doing some some of our own um, spot checking, but you know we're excited to partner with with you and, and the health and wellness group on on looking for other pilot opportunities um, so that uh, you know we can collect data and share data with with our families and and obviously our staff members so that uh, um, we can remove some of the doubt that's involved or some of the the you know the the, the fears involved with indoor air quality uh, through through our our data collection and measurement. so um, again, looking forward to continue to working with you on that, those initiatives and piloting that in as many schools as possible. We appreciate all of your time and working on that. Um, I kind of shifting gears here a little bit. Uh, we have a couple questions about mental health. Um, so we have how can we maintain the mental health of students during the construction? Um, and also, I think just during COVID times, um, this may be sort of for taking Seth off the hot spot <laughs> um, and just talking to the Board of Ed. Um, and I know in general, this is a thing throughout the district, um, but with construction happening and a lot of the transitions on top of that with COVID, um, just ask. I think the board members or ask, put it out there for anybody who can answer that question in terms of mental health. Hi, so uh, my name is Michelle Palmer. I'm the coordinator for psychological services. I actually want to um, introduce my associate superintendent, Mr. Everett Davis, who's also here in the meeting in case he wants to address anything before I do. Um, but that seems to be kind of under our bailiwick to, to handle. Everett. Good evening, and thank you for that, uh, Michelle. Good evening to the members of the board, as well as to our parent leadership. Thank you for uh, having us here this evening, and I just appreciate the opportunity to be able to share uh, the supports that our shop provides, the student family support and engagement, uh, which does include, as Michelle said, our mental health supports, which are a part of our Be Well 365 
uh, initiative, which hopefully you've heard about, but hopefully we can share a little bit more about that uh, this evening. And so I so appreciate the question around mental health, uh, as well as some of the resources that we can bring and that we do have in place, uh, as well as some, some updates for you. I'll, I'll let Michelle share that uh, as our coordinator uh, for the Division of Psychological Services. So Michelle, please. So um, one of the things that uh, one of my takeaways are from the earlier presentations that I saw had to do with how um, there is a great need in Poolsville for social emotional um, supports and mental health supports. And one of the things that we know as a county um, and as an office is that Poolsville is one of the areas of the county that really lacks um, local mental health supports. And one of the things we strive for in, in MCPS is to bring supports in as best we can. So we actually had a conversation with one of the vendors that we partner with, Jewish Social Services Agency, Jessa, and we will be bringing increased mental health supports through Jessa to three of the schools in the um, Poolsville cluster at this point. We're not, and these will be in-person therapy uh, services for students and for families um, should that should families want to partake as well. But these are things that um, we've been thinking about as we try to expand this particular initiative. Poolsville was at the top of the list. And, and literally today we had the conversation that we're gonna be able to add that. Um, we can't quite add um, in-person to monocacy yet, but we could work at telehealth for students with at monocacy. So that would kind of encompass um, all of those needs, if you will. Um, we're, we're really very pleased um, with what we've been doing with Jessa this past year. It's a relatively new initiative. Would telehealth services being uh, included in the Jessa services? Um, we, we had a conversation today with Jessa about that um, for potentially for monocacy. We're looking more at in-person services for the other three schools um, because that's essentially, uh, though, when we started and we were still um, virtual uh, with most things, we, we um, uh, received funds to add Jessa to the cadre of mental health supports and agencies that we worked with um, middle of last school year. And um, at the time, everything was virtual then. But since the start of the school year, everything has been in person. It's more that the three schools that we're talking about in Poolsville are in close proximity to one, uh, one another. Poor monoxy is a, a bit further afield, and it would be harder uh, at this juncture anyway to have an in-person person there. Do you have a comment to your question? Uh, yeah, and how? And so the in-person services, how would they be delivered at the other three schools? That's really something that Jessa would talk um, with at the school level. The principals and the the um, folks at the building literally got emails today because this was a conversation we had today. Um, but they would work with the school to find a space for therapists to come into the building and. Um, and support students. There's another question here about um, whether it be individual counseling offered um, or group settings or both. Um, I would have to defer to Jessa. I know it would be, a, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I'm not muted. Um, I would defer to Jessa and as that gets rolled out, there would be training that would happen with the school and then information that would go out from the school and from Jessa to the school community to, to explain all of that. I definitely know that it's individual. There may be groups involved, but at the moment um, I can't specifically answer that. Okay, um, and then as a follow-up to that, how do students and families access su um, support from the new JESA services? That's a great question. Typically the referrals come through the educational management team. Um, so uh, meetings being held at the school, uh, Educational management team stands for EM, is EMT, and um, that is one avenue. Student well-being teams can also make referrals. Uh, oftentimes, the referrals go through the school counselors from there, um, but that's the typical avenue. 
Great. And will the school be fully ADA compliant once the new, will Poozle High School be fully ADA compliant once the new construction is done? So I think that's not a me question. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I actually did have another question for you, Seth, while we got you um, for the water quality. So we've had, um, Poolsville's had some bigger problems with lead and drinking water issues um, in the past. Um, and levels have been really high in the past um, concerning. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to know, I know you're putting in two hydration stations in every school that are filtered for lead. Um, and uh, so wondering, um, how that's going with Poolswell Elementary School. I know Monoxy is just on bottled water, so that's not an issue um, because we're in well. Um, and then the middle school and high schools too, because there's no safe level of lead even for those ages. Yeah, so so the, the Board of Education did approve that contract. And unfortunately, the, uh, the units themselves uh, were on a 14, 15 week lead time, meaning um, they actually are just starting to, to schedule to come in either this week or next week, and we'll begin the, the rollout installation. So, so again, we'll follow up with the principals of, of each school and, and let them know the timeline. But, um, you know, we did have a material delay uh, getting those uh, um, uh, water bottle filling stations. But, you know, thankfully, our board did approve that and, and expedited it. So hopefully soon they will be begin installed with filters. Yes. Yeah, so and right now there are some hydration stations I know from um, what I've talked to community members in Poolsville Elementary School. Um, are those filtered? Do you know? I have to go back and look, but a part of this program is also to retrofit um, units that were not filtered with filters. Okay, and in the meantime, in the interim, um, are we doing bottled water um, or is that something that principals can ask for if they feel like they need that, especially to protect the youngest, but any of the students? Uh, yes, I think it's a it's a combination of of bottled water, the larger you know they're both called bottled water, but you know the smaller scale bottles, uh, the the larger dispensers, um, and then obviously if, if you have uh, uh, you know safe spaces to to you know fill water containers, we're obviously encouraging um, reusable units along the way. So. So again, I know there's been lots of questions, particularly from schools, but if, if schools have questions around um, getting access to either the small bottles or the, the larger dispensers, um, please feel free to reach out and uh, we, we, will, we will provide what's needed. We can discuss that maybe one of our environmental health committee meetings. Great. Um, and then uh, we had another question. Will hydration stations currently in schools be reused in new PHS construction. So in the public high school, are you be putting new ones? No, I mean, so we'll have all brand new ones in, in the new spaces. We don't, we really try not to reuse, transfer things from, from one space to the other, but, but certainly they'll be operational during construction. Um, and, and depending on where they are in, in the building itself, um, you know, we'll, we'll obviously come online at different, different stages, but you know, the intent would be to install new um, particularly, obviously, in the areas that we're, we're, we're constructing or, or renovating, which is really most, if not all, the building. So, yes, they will be new. Um, there were some other questions um, about mental health. So, I guess we're going to kind of punt it back to Michelle Palmer again. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. What was the question? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, how can we implement mental health to education right now? Because there are many students getting overloaded with schoolwork. So, can, what's there now um, in terms of just support for students and staff, honestly, too? Right. So, the we have social emotional learning lessons that are going on in all the schools. Um, we have we are in the process of piloting an actual social um, social emotional learning program called the leader and me in a number of the schools across the county but within the next three years we will be gradually adding more schools so ultimately the entire cluster uh Poolsville cluster will be engaging in um the leader and me as a social emotional learning curriculum in conjunction with all of the other um academic 
curricula that they work on. Um, but the social emotional learning lessons that the school has going that we started last year while we were still virtual are things that are available to all students um, across the county, um, but definitely within Poolsville. We know that our students are stretched and stressed. We know that our staff are. Um, from a staff perspective, there's always the um, EAP, the Employee Assistance Program that's there, um, but we encourage mindfulness strategies. We encourage anything that folks can do to um, lessen their stress levels and um, seeking out their counselors, seeking out their school psychologist as well if there's additional supports. And, and ultimately the student well-being team can take a look at those kinds of um, broader stressors that folks in the school are having to see if there are um, supports that can be provided either through outside mental health providers or within the building by the providers that are there as well. And I just wanted to add to what Michelle said. Um, in addition to those resources, there are personal body safety lessons, which, mm -hmm. which go through our K to 12. Um, also signs of suicide, which are for our secondary students is six to 12. Uh, and also our, our resources on our website. If you have not visited our, our student family support and engagement website, I know she mentioned one mindfulness, uh, Mr. Jeff Donald, who is our mindfulness uh, instructional specialist, uh, there are videos there, resources for, uh, for the staff and also for our parents as well. I want to make sure that that is elevated. In addition to our Waymaking series, who Dr. Uh, Christina Conley, who is our director of school psychology, uh, she is the host of those Waymaking series. And it actually came out of the pandemic, uh, an opportunity that the pandemic provided for us. Um, so if you have not visited those, uh, the, please do so there. I'll just make a little uh, promo for three upcoming episodes. One is around the leader in me that you just heard uh, Michelle mention, which is our social emotional learning curriculum. Uh, one is around restorative justice and also be on the lookout for another one around the COVID, uh, the Delta variant and how, how to support one another as we navigate that. So again, all that information is on our website. You can simply type in mindfulness uh, from the main uh, MCPS homepage uh, or Waymaking for additional information. And just to piggyback on that, um, we are uh, hosting a um, Mental Health Awareness Week in November from the 8th to the 13th of November. It's a, a joint venture between MCPS and Student Family Support and Engagement and uh, the Montgomery County School Psychologist Association. And there will be lots of information for students. We actually have three live events this, this year, um, one of which is specifically focusing on students and their needs, but we also have a number of um, video presentations to support families and how do families support their students, how do families support themselves. Um, and so I, I encourage you to keep that in mind. There will be um, flyers and things come out sooner uh, than later on that. Uh, and that's another area that you can um, look for supports as well. Great. And I, I guess there was a really good question here um, about just have you engaged with students themselves to ask them um, what would be the most helpful in terms of supporting them and in, in their mental health and social emotional well-being? Because um, asking them, there's a note here that says some, some of these resources weren't that helpful. Um, so just reaching out to them and asking them um, what would be. So I'm sorry, I, I yes, sitting down and having a frank conversation with your, your child. Um, hey, things are kind of tough and weird right now and, and we all have different feelings about what's going on. And um, acknowledging some of your own feelings without you know, doing something that's developmentally beyond you, the age of your, your child, but ask them what kinds of feelings they might be having. Discuss the kinds of feelings that different people have. Um, again, keeping it in a, in a developmentally appropriate way. What you talk to an elementary student is going to be different than what you say to a middle or a high school student. Um, sometimes talking about these things go better when you're in the middle of doing something more mundane, like maybe you're both making dinner and saying, 
hey, you know, how are things going? Kids sometimes don't talk about things when you ask them directly, but if you ask them, you know, questions while you're in the middle of other things, they might come up with answers and you might be able to glean some information from them about what they're, uh, what they're concerned about. But you can also talk to them to say, hey, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to talk to your parent about things. But if you have a trusted adult in your school building, whether it's a, a particular teacher or a coach or your counselor or a psychologist or a family friend that is a trusted adult, um, making sure they know that there are people out there that if maybe they don't want to share with their parents, um, though we all would prefer that they do, um, that there's someone else out there that they can talk to. We talk about that a lot in the SOS Signs of Suicide program. The idea that it, for people, for kids, talking with someone that they trust um, is, is what we want them to do. Yeah, I think that question, thanks for answering that, but I think um, I think the question maybe more was what MCPS engaging with students to ask them what kind of resources they need. Um, and asking how you're engaging with them to just to hear from them. Hannah Aluni, I saw her kind of shake her head um, and they're under a lot of stress and just talking to them about what resources are helpful um, when you strategize on ways to reach out. No, and, and thank you for that. I wanted to clarify whether that was resources for parents, uh, for families or, or, or for us as MCPS. And I can speak to one of the ways that we have done that is through what's called a student well-being achievement uh, or action, excuse me, group swag, uh, where we have engaged, and that's that's been the work very closely of our team, uh, engaging with students around what are the needs, because I think the point of the question, rather than us guessing, uh, we need to engage with our students to ask. I know I'm a parent of three MCPS students as well, and so rather than me guessing, uh, I, I might as well talk to the three that live under my household and ask them, um, what, what is it that they need? So yes, we have done that in a, in a very formal uh, and organized way, just to let you know, again, it's called the SWAG group. The last health and safety question, um, I'm gonna let Anne-Marie answer it. It's about water bottles and single use water bottles. Did you wanna answer that live about? Um... You were gonna have Anne-Marie answer it? Or did yeah. You... Anne Marie wouldn't know what to answer. I don't know. I don't know what Anne Marie you're talking about. Oh, I it, I had got a message saying that you would like to answer the question live, and I guess yeah, I've never. Sorry, that's a mistake on my part. Uh, so we were wondering about the um, is there an emphasis on reusable containers that's being addressed regarding the use of water bottles? Um, and we're just wondering. I think the parent is wondering if we're going to be trying to reduce the uh, usage of single use water bottles in our schools. The, the answer is yes on that one. And, and we, uh, we were able to, through the sustainability division, issue some um, you know, reusable water bottles. And, and it's an initiative that we're, we're hoping to expand in the very near future. But, but yes, part of our sustainability efforts is to reduce the number of single use um, water bottles. But, but obviously, as we're navigating um, you know, this, this post pandemic world, we, we are still utilizing them in, in some cases but if there's a strong interest in reusable please again reach out and we can we can look to uh, uh to send some your way great yeah i think um we would like to know um any responses from the board of education about the agenda about the agenda items just thus far and the um and the uh, questions from the parents Uh, Carla, you wanted to say something, go ahead. Uh, Janie, if you could mute again. Thank you. No, I, I was, um, you know, listening throughout the whole meeting as, as, as everyone is, but uh, one thing that I wanted to address and maybe bring it up to our um, Ms. Morris and other folks is this issue of the middle school not having enough offerings and I know that um, that's a concern and it's an opportunity as you all have planted it uh, with virtual learning. I know that we are piloting some countywide programs this year, French 
and I forget what other uh, course, but uh, we will only learn from this experience and hopefully we'll be able to do a lot more offerings um, in the coming years. So um, that really resonated with me. And I just wanted to share that we are piloting some courses this year. And uh, so keep uh, sending us information about what is needed at the middle school level. So hopefully we can put something in place soon. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak at this time? I would like to ask a question just so that I'm clear I'm understanding. And I, I saw the question in the chat. So um, Michelle, this question is for you. It has to do with um, telehealth versus in-person health services. Is there a reason why we are doing, we're not doing in-person services for, I believe it's the elementary school? Yeah, um, we, there's a finite amount of um, uh, therapists, et cetera. And so when we respond, we, or when we um, add on services, add on new schools, we can only add on a certain number at a time. And when we talk with Jessa, they don't have the capacity to do um, an in-person beyond the three schools at Monocacy or excuse me, the three schools um, that are close to one another in Poolsville, they don't have the ability to go to four. They have the ability to do three, which is why we chose those three as opposed to um, offering also in-person a monocacy. They simply don't have the capacity at the moment to do that. It's not that we wouldn't or couldn't at some point in the future. It's about capacity right now. Well, I'd like us to continue looking at that because I do think that that is an important issue. Um, does anyone else want to continue or say anything at this time? Otherwise, we can move on to the equity issues. I just wanted to say one more, sorry, one more thing. Um, we're in this pandemic, and I think this is something just speaking to the board um, and also to our community about um, issues around having data. Um, and a dashboard up. I know this is something that MCPS is working on, um, but students feeling safe, um, teachers feeling safe, safe in their schools and their classrooms and communicating when, if there's a positive case to the classroom, especially at the elementary level where they're unvaccinated um, and where they're cohorted more often um, at the classroom level, just letting them know that there's a positive case, keeping privacy keeping things private, but um, communicating with parents so they can make a choice, especially with vulnerable students that have asthma or other underlying conditions. Like parents can choose to protect their children by bringing, by, by keeping them out for 10 days um, if they need to be protected. Um, it's, it's an equity issue too, um, because those that are most vulnerable need to be protected the most. Um, and then the dashboard, getting that up. Um, we have some of our subject matter experts helping um, from our committee, the Health and Wellness Committee. Um, and would really encourage the board um, and the advisory board now that's been established to listen to them. They're wonderful people and they've got a lot of expertise. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, they have a mock-up of a dashboard that is fantastic. Um, and so just working with MCPS to help develop that. Um, we need denominators. We need to know percentages, not just how many are quarantined. We need to know how many per school in percentages. Um, that's a big thing, so. So we're yeah. gonna move on to equity issues. I wanted to thank um, uh, Ms. Silvestri for bringing up the, um, the issue of programming at JPMS because the issue of uh, programming dovetails into the issue of staffing. And because of the small size of the Poolsville Cluster Schools, um, there's always been a sense that um, the, 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 the equity issue has to do with small staffing anomalies can have a big ripple effect on an entire school. Uh, we've got, done, gotten a lot of messages and um, feedback from parents specifically about the situation at Monocacy Elementary in their third grade classroom where they have 34 students. Um, and um, because I work for NCPS, I'm aware of um, the rather severe staffing issues that we're having in the system. And so I don't know if one of the principals, if, uh, Ms. Alban would like to respond to that or possibly 
um, uh, Dr. Ennis, but um, just to, to talk about what is happening writ large with staffing, it is impact, impacting our, our schools more, but I think the parents need to hear about what is actually happening with staffing throughout MCPS. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Jane. Um, good evening. I'm Jane Ennis. I'm uh, the director uh, supporting Poulsville Cluster, and I'd like to introduce my supervisor, our Area 3 Associate Superintendent, Diane Morris, and uh, perhaps we can tag team and uh, as well as Ms. Alban. Um, do you want to start with that, Diane? Just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity to spend the night with you and to hear about all the great things. Um, I often get a chance to drive up there to visit our schools. I was just there last week. It's one of my favorite places. I love the drive up. Um, so yes, there are challenges due to the size of the school when we talk about staffing, particularly that's one that we've been um, trying to address at the middle school because they have only a few sections of each course. And so the more staff you have, the more sections that you can offer or a greater variety of classes that you can offer. So I appreciate Ms. Silvestri bringing up the option and I wrote it down of exploring now that we're in a virtual space, how can we bring that in and open up opportunity and access when we talk about equity for the students in Poolsville to be able to access other courses in other schools. So that's definitely something that we will look in. We appreciate your patience with this. I was a director for middle schools. Um, and so I had Poolsville cluster that was in 2014. Um, and I've been the associate, so I've been in the in the Poolsville cluster now for eight years. So um, I've really had an opportunity to work closely, and I'm aware of the challenges. Monocacy, um, yes, our our smallest school, but mighty for sure, and under great leadership. And so we know that the challenges exist there. We've been working with Kristen around that third grade staffing, fifth grade st staffing, how we can think. Um, more creatively around that. Um, so these are all things that your principals had been advocating for. And um, I think that we can put our heads together like, a, like, like Carla said in this era now that we're exploring, there are so many other options that we certainly um, can sit down and do some planning and get back to you on that. Thank you. But um, in terms of Monocacy Elementary School, my understanding is that the, the issue with the third grade is not because of lack of trying, it's, it, it's a lack of, of people applying for, the, for, um, for teaching jobs. And if somebody in leadership could uh, address that either specifically with Monocacy or writ large, um, how many staffing positions are there in Montgomery County Public Schools for teachers? Are you having part, a harder time finding teachers at this point? So the answer is yes, and it, it's beyond just teachers, it's paraeducators, it's classroom monitors. So even what we're finding is even when we give the school the allocation, we say you have this position, go out and hire due to COVID fears, all those things that um, it's been a challenging year. We, we make gains every day. Um, our uh, OHRD, our Office of Human um, uh, Resources does a great job of recruiting. They were just out visiting a bunch of colleges, but still there is a, there is a shortage and it's nationwide. And so we are doing the best we can. We're trying to be creative. And so that's where you're hearing about they have the, the allocation, but we're not able to fill it with a person. So the position for the Monocacy third grade teacher was posted, it just wasn't picked up. Is that a correct statement? I see that Dr. Is correct. Yes. That is correct. The position was posted, but uh, we, we don't have any, at this time, we don't have any viable candidates. And, um, you know, Ms. Alban can add to that if, if you have any updates to that. I, I just full disclosure, I'm a long term sub in a middle school. Um, I was a long term sub for a full year last year. And um, I know that staff, staff, sadly, staffing is an issue everywhere. But again, the problem about our schools is because the schools are so small, even being short one staffing position 
can be extremely impactful. Uh, would it be okay to ask, um, with so many elementary positions available, uh, would it be possible to prioritize Monocacy Elementary just because of the percentage of staff that they're missing as we go forward? I think that it's in addition to the school being small, the location of the school attracts a smaller group of individuals. So that becomes part of the challenge. I joke with Kristen and I say, I'm coming out, I'm gonna pack a lunch for my you know, ride out there. We joke about it, but for some, if you live in the Eastern part of the, the county, um, you know, it's, it's quite a trek. And so I think that creates a problem, just the, the location, so we can't, hire and and say this is where you're being placed but certainly um we try to keep it open and as ohrd hires people they certainly push them through to certain schools to make sure that they're seeing those candidates and that's happening but i think it's it's a it's it's kind of an intersection of a few variables there that are have created those uh positions to stay vacant Yeah, and I guess I just want to add, I mean, that's true. And then we did convert that to a long term substitute position. And again, because of where we're located, it's been difficult to find that we're experiencing a sub shortage as well. Um, but we do have a long term sub that's supporting the third grade as well as creatively using the staff development teacher and reading specialist. Um, so the kids do get a reduced class size for the key content areas. Um, and then we were awarded some extra pair educator time. So I'm networking um, with colleges that I have networks with. We're hoping for a December grad. I know we're competing with many other schools um, and certainly want the right person with the right fit, but we are working creatively to address those needs and are reducing the time that the kids are all together. Okay, um, we are getting very close to our, um, the end of the meeting. Um, I would like Dr. Wolf, uh, I, uh, Ms. Wolf, would you like to um, uh, extend some closing comments to the meeting? Thank you for the opportunity. It was really great to, to come out. Well, we're on Zoom, of course, but it was a really great turnout tonight and we've had really great questions. I think on behalf of the board, I just want to say that we appreciate the opportunity to hear from the Poolsville community and to hear your concerns. Because if you think about it, we look at you as our eyes and ears to what's going on and what's needed out there. So these discussions are always important. I know that we didn't get to many of the questions that were pending because we still have some, I'm sure, equity uh, issues to address. I would like to have you send in the questions and we will be sure to provide answers because I do think that these are some important issues that still need to be addressed. And I look forward to coming out and visiting with you when we can actually see each other in person. Does anybody else on the board wanna say anything before we go? I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll oh, hold on, Ms. Evans and Ms. O'Looney. Go ahead. Yes, um, so just wanted to say um, great seeing everyone virtually. Um, and then I did hear it, it being mentioned that um, we were supposed to come out. Oh, that's my dog. Please forgive me. Um, <laughs> we were supposed to come out prior to the pandemic, but don't think that that um, de the delay means that we care less. So you have great advocates in Poolsville. I will be out there tomorrow for a volleyball game. So I'll make sure I get out there early enough to take a look around. But please um, in invite us. And, you know, everything that we heard today are not things that we haven't heard before. But um, definitely we're always trying to make sure that we can make improvements. So just thank you for coming out today and bearing with me for my puppy in the background. So good seeing you all and have a good rest of the week. Hannah, you're up. Yes, just two things I wanted to follow up on. First, uh, Ms. Donert's comment about the COVID-19 dashboard. Um, I know that that will be up later this week. I think we're aiming for Thursday. So that's something to look forward to. Um, the other thing, um, one thing I've always admired about the Poolsville community 
the middle school and the high school is um, the real sense of environmental stewardship that you all have up in Poolsville, um, not just in the Global Ecology Program at the high school, but also when I went to visit John Poole um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to students. Sometimes they'll share, you know, random tidbits of their day with me. And I kept hearing about an environmental science elective from almost every student that I spoke to. And that is not an elective that is available at very many of our middle schools, if any at all. So yes, I am very sympathetic to bringing you all more electives through the endless possibilities of Zoom and this new virtual world we're living in. But I'd also love to see um, the opportunities that you all have cultivated here in Poolsville expanded to the rest of the county. So um, a lot of very exciting work that you all are doing. Thank you. And I think that that concludes our meeting for tonight. It was great talking to you, and I look forward to getting out there soon. Thank you very much for, uh, for everybody to, for attending tonight. Stay tuned for November 8th and our CIP meeting. I'll see you at Forever on November the 8th. I'll be there. Thank you.